my kind of morals are, and in working with my clients, a insecure disembodied state tends to result in immoral behavior mm. that ends up harming ourselves and ends up harming others. And, and so we can say, um, we can say we want to advocate for peace, but peace really comes from within and then it really radiates out into the macros. Welcome to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where we explore life through the lens of somatics. I'm Luis Mojica, a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. Okay, welcome, my friends. Uh, I have a very, very special guest here. What I was just saying, one of the OGs of the podcast, uh, April Dawn Harder. Welcome, my friend. Thank you. So... I was saying to you that I wanted to tell the audience, if you go way back, I think it's episode four and five or five and six. It's like one of the earliest ones I did. Uh, I was very attracted to your work in early 2020 because there was this heightened awareness, particularly on social media, of racialized trauma because of George Floyd's murder. And so what was really fascinating was someone had sent me a link to your Instagram profile. And I saw this card, you know, those little text cards we would put and it said, dear white people, you don't have to let POC abuse you. And I was like, what? I never heard that before. And I clicked on it. And what you were speaking about took so much courage to speak about. And it was particularly how the euphoria that can come from having a platform finally, right? That can turn into a trauma reenactment of oppression through shaming. And, and I, I don't remember the words. I just remember what I got from it was, and I wrote it down, shaming people into accountability. And we were seeing white people who uh, were feeling extreme guilt and shame, fawning, performing into these circles with people of color and just listening to anything they said to try to gain the respect, to gain approval, to be the good person. And some people took advantage of that. Some people didn't. You're one that didn't. Some people took advantage of that. And for you to say it, and the way you speak is so matter of fact and kind. There's no semantics. There was no judgment. I didn't feel like you were calling anybody out. You were just kind of saying it. And it landed so deep in me. So I find it kind of magical that three years ago, that's how I met you. I've never forgotten any of our conversations <laughs> or our little Zoom lunches we had. <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then kind of like lost touch with you. I've been following you from afar, but we haven't spoken. And then this situation has come up with Israel and Palestine, you know, Israel and Hamas, however you want to frame it. Mm. And the same thing's happening on social media. People are shaming people into accountability. And I reached out to you right away and I said, hey, I'm really curious about your take. And you gave me, gosh, you gave me what I wanted to hear. Um, it was so, it was everything I didn't know how to say, but felt so I guess I'm going to pause there for a moment before I go into these things that I got from our conversation. Where, where do you go with what I said so far? Like, how do you witness this experience? Yeah. Uh, how do I witness this experience in a similar way? Um, I guess let's just talk. We might as well talk your language because a lot of people who follow your podcast, let's just start with the body. Mm. My first reaction was in my stomach. I just felt it. I was like, oh, you know, like, it's this kind of, it's basically a mild level of disgust, to be frank. Mm -hmm. um, it is an indication to me that something's not morally right with me. I don't mm -hmm. feel like something's, something's off. Mm -hmm. Something's off, right? <clears throat> and that's what I trusted so many years ago. Yeah. But I just, and I was able to articulate it when I met you and we have worked together. Prior to that, I, I didn't listen to that because, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I feel that the reason why I'm able to take such a humanistic approach to this is because I'm choosing to be accountable for my own narcissism. Mm -hmm. And so when you take accountability for your own enmeshment, essentially, right? Um, it's like you tend to have more compassion when you're taking, because you understand where they're coming from. Whereas right. 
you don't, you lack the empathy, you lack the compassion. I understand. Like, so now moving back to that, right? Um, that was my, so that's my first visceral response, right? And then the I just want to pause a minute for people yeah, hearing. Yeah. I just yeah. want them to know if you're not understanding what we're talking about, go back. I think it's, I think it's episode four and five. Evan will put it in the episode details here. We have two long, deep, generous, nuanced uh, podcast episodes. We broke them into two parts. It was so deep. And April breaks down narcissism as an addiction, as a like a biochemical experience. And I, I want everyone to hear that. If, if what we're saying isn't making sense, you might want to pause, listen, and come back here. So I just wanted to say that, but please continue. Absolutely. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I've changed it up just a little bit, but most of it's still the same. It's still based on that endogenous opioid release. And that's where I got really extensive, you know, in, in the previous um, podcast episode where you interviewed me, where I broke that down. Still the same, still the same endogenous opioid activation. However, what adds to that is that I realized that like back then I couldn't figure out, is it addiction to violence? Is it addiction to people? And then it was like, okay, addiction to endogenous opioids, but what is the catalyst? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the catalyst? And it is the enmeshment. So the thing I want everyone to know is that what I teach, right, is that narcissism, narc, just simply means to numb. Mm -hmm. You're numbing because we have in our bodies natural pain relievers. And mm -hmm. how do we activate this? Well, having those natural pain relievers is not a bad thing. It's natural. However, we can break it down to that secure attachment or the insecure attachment. The insecure attachment I see is narcissistic. It's very numbing and um, it's insecure. It's not embodied, right? It's yep. dissociative. It's, yep. it's, not a, it's not a healthy thing and it is rooted in trauma. So the enmeshment breaks down to two different types, right? And back then I would say overt and covert narcissism. <clears throat> Now I just say it's narcissism, although it can be overt and covert, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, I get that. But, but what I'm really focusing now, and, and I've just done a better job over the, the past few years to like refine my work, is that that overt and covert, the covert tends to be more people that fail to enforce their boundaries. And that okay. tends to be the, quote, the traditional codependent, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyone watching this, something just happened. <laughs> Some magic just happened on April's screen. <laughs> Some That's so trick. weird. I don't know why it does it. I have to figure out why. I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm fine with it. But actually, this is a that's a, a confetti pause because you just said something that blew my mind. I never heard it yeah. that way. Secure attachment yeah. is an embodied experience. Insecure yeah. attachment is a disembodied one. Absolutely. Now that's phenomenal because. One of the points that came up when we were discussing the the shaming into accountability, particularly right now with, with the situation in the Middle East, yes. I wrote down, forcing people to take sides because of the desperation to meet attachment needs. Now, break that down for us, because that's like, ooh, what does yeah. that mean? Well, you know, when I... I'm so glad you asked the questions because yeah, I could with my ADHD, I, I get off. <laughs> me too. Trust me. I just, my ADHD you know. sees your ADHD. <laughs> I need that. Yeah. Um, so, so with the so, what is the attachment need that we're that Palestinians, for example, are looking for? What is the attachment need that uh, Zionist Jews, right, Jewish people who identify with Zionism, what is the attachment need that they're looking for? Well, in my observation, just based on what they say, they're looking for safety. Mm, yep. They're looking for safety. So you, you've got like people who are looking for safety. Now, are we going to now go about that in an enmeshed way mm -hmm. or in a non enmeshed way, which is essentially secure way, secure attachment or insecure attachment, embodied or disembodied, dissociative or not dissociative. Like that's the thing. So my kind of morals are, and in working with my clients, a insecure disembodied state tends to result in immoral behavior. Mm. And that ends up harming ourselves and ends up harming others. And, and so we can say, 
Um, we can say we want to advocate for peace, but peace really comes from within and then it really radiates out into the macro. So I'm a firm believer that, that, that the, when we see war, when we see violence, it really is a reflection, unfortunately, of a lack of healing from within. And it all starts in one's family of origin. So we're talking about family enmeshment and that about generational trauma, right? With that, like centuries of things that have compiled in bodies. Yeah. So we're well, so, at generational trauma. Yeah. And so that's this, that's this great understanding of the macro in terms of the current conflict, the ongoing conflict, but the current awareness of it. Um, how does that break down? I, mean, I, I hear it break down the same way, but when I think about being on social media and people pressuring each other, you know, saying like your silence is violence or saying, um, you know, like, like the, these kind of phrases we say at the other to kind of shame them into hashtagging ceasefire. Like literally I've been yeah. seeing that a lot. Well, yeah. Same thing, right? The person pressuring the other is looking for safety. Like, what would you call that? They want to, the attachment need there would be to be seen and to be heard. Hmm. You know, they want to be seen, they want to be heard, because if you're oppressed, you typically are not seen and not heard, and there's a lack of empathy. So to be seen and to be heard, to be validated, but especially I think in my observation, like to be seen and to be heard, mm -hmm. um, that's going to be the primary attachment need. But again, you know, people have to um, consent to that. So now we're looking at the type of accountability. So... Mm -hmm. Like you said earlier, it, it so when it comes to pressuring people right into accountability, um, folks have to do, they have to do in such a way where they're not, I love your words, like um, where they're not disembodied. And in my way, I look, they're not dissociating because, and I'm going to tell you why. Yeah. Because it just doesn't, it's not um, sustainable. I see this on your work as well. The body can't handle it long term. And nope. It cannot. And 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 in that sense, neither can the world. The whole world burns mm. up. And that's mm. why we're in the situation we're in, among other reasons. Um, now, as far as um I kind of want to get to a point where in my mind I go, what about saying that there's an enabling occurring? Because <clears throat> this approach that I have, I'm you know, I'll get feedback at times like, well, April, um, you're not holding these people accountable, right? You're not holding certain people accountable. But the thing is, is that I cannot shame someone to change. I cannot, that is a choice that people have to make. We can certainly educate. We can certainly raise awareness, Right now, yep. why? So that's the thing is that you've got to consent or you're just going to end up performing. And then the solidarity is not actually going to be there. That's also not sustainable. That's not sustainable. Right. Because like performative solidarity, if we're talking about. So we're talking about the unsustainability comes from being disembodied, which makes complete sense to me. So yeah. if I'm performing because I'm being shamed and I want to belong, let's just say that's one, yeah. one, one of many reasons. So yeah. I'm performing solidarity, but if it's a disembodied performance, I can't even keep up this performance of solidarity. Eventually it degrades and it, I can't hold it because it's not actually real. Yeah. And not so only I'm, that, and I want to add to that too, which is that, it's also lacking empathy. Mm. So it's mm. very performative empathy too. Yes. So that's when you're going to fool people into thinking you're in solidarity, but you're really not. Um, and then that's when I find that in my work, those people are then exposed for being um, fraudulent, like mm -hmm. pretenders, like yep. they're just pretending Right. And then they get called out mm -hmm. on that pretending because they do. They they people find out like they yeah. really weren't in solidarity because it's unsustainable. You can't keep that up. It, it's a lie because it's a lie. And that's the thing. Right. So we're we're lying when we're lying to ourselves. So if mm -hmm. we so if we lie to ourselves, we're going to lie to other people and we're going to we're going to say on the surface we're doing moral things when in reality, like 
we're not being honest, that wouldn't be honest to other people. We're actually being very disingenuous with them. Mm -hmm. So we're not actually being genuine. So then the question is, and this is where I get into it. Like I asked back then, and even now, you know, for example, Palestinians back in the day with African-Americans, people of color, period. It's like my question to those listening that, that identify as POC is this. Um, do you want people who are going that you can trust that are in true, true solidarity with you? I mean, really? Or do you just want people to perform and then you find out later you can't trust them <laughs> because the trust has got to be there. And if you perform, you're not even establishing like a like a um, a foundation of trust in the relationship, which guess what? Then there's no real intimacy. That's so right. if there's no intimacy, there's no trust, there's no solidarity. There's nothing. So it's an I, imitation of a relationship. There isn't actually a foundation of relating happening. Yeah. So then so well, then so wait, when you said uh, enabling, this is interesting to me. I, I don't know if I'm hearing this correctly, but would the enablers be the performers, the ones that are enabling the person that's shaming them? Is that what you mean by enablers in this? Well, well you know, I see, I see, so I see narcissism on, on these two different fronts, right? Mm -hmm. So with that said, right, you, <laughs> yeah. you, oh my God. again, everybody, just some virtual <laughs> balloons just, just came on the screen. We it's don't know silly. why. It's We're silly. just going to go with it. Uh, we're going to go with it. So the thing, thing is, come on, Luis, you know, with me, you're going to have some stuff that's unexpected. I, um, that's, I wouldn't have it any way. <laughs> so, so in order to be really objective about this, we I analyze the narcissism on both sides, both from the perpetrator and those who were the victims, right? Um, so we need to make some distinctions. So in my assessment, you know, with the Zionist Jews, like what they're doing and have done, and this is just my fair assessment looking at history, you know, they have violated the boundaries of the Palestinians like over and over again, right? And so that's it. So that's an example of oppression where, unfortunately, you know, these Palestinians, they haven't had the power to enforce their boundaries. And that's sad. So it's important for people listening to realize that, you know, it's the Palestinians in that sense, if they're getting totally oppressed, they, they can't actually, they don't even have the means to like enforce their boundaries which is very different than people who can enforce their boundaries, right? So it so that's one important like point to make. So when we're talking about enablers, we have to figure out is this a situ if it's a situation where there's oppression, then you have a perpetrator overpowering and the victim truly can has no choice. Like they truly are in a bind, right? That's mm -hmm. one thing versus in personal relationships or even in the public. Um, what if people have choices? So, mm -hmm. so when we're trying to figure out enablers and trying to figure out who's being narcissistic, who's being enmeshed, we have to go, do people have choices? Do they not have, what are the, what are the extent of the choices that they can make versus those choices that have been made for them because they've been overpowered. So that, that, so we're looking at those kind of, you know, dynamics. So, so what would you say is happening with the group of people, let's say on Instagram who mm -hmm. are telling people they're essentially bad if they don't act the way that mm -hmm. we, they think they should act for justice. Like what would that group be? Cause you said something else I wrote down, a uh, forced withdrawal mm -hmm. comes and then we shame people into agreeing with us from the forced withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So what are okay. these people withdrawing from when they're shaming people online? Not getting their attachment needs met. So the thing is, is that in that sense, we're there. Okay. So the shaming is connected to anger, the anger stage and the bargaining stage. Okay. In the stages of grief, because when you don't get your attachment needs met, right? In this case, for example, it would be safety to be seen and to be heard. Um, when you are the victim or when you empathize with the victims, right? Even the value, you know, um, when that doesn't happen, 
people have a right to advocate for themselves for sure. Mm -hmm. But then the shaming aspect is manipulative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's manipulative again, is because if people do not consent to take the kind of accountability that uh, others think they should, right. Um, then it's manipulative on one's part. So if I shame someone and I say, if you don't practice activism in a way that I think is uh, superior, good enough, whatever we have, like I would then have a moral superiority hmm. reality when I'm coming from that moral superiority, right? I'm not actually taking accountability and even recognizing how I'm actually projecting onto that other person or people. So that's like, you know, um, okay that's the thing and so well what you said what you said i thought was really important i want to pluck it out yeah. you said um mm -hmm. even you said oppressed people or people identifying with oppressed people and that feels important because when i see uh let's say like the american allies for whatever side it is there are people that are um, more on israel's side there are people that are more on Palestine's side what I've seen in both of them is exactly what you just said. They identify with some form of oppression right. and see themselves in that side. Yes. So when you're identifying with an oppression, yeah. then you, you feel oppressed because your yeah. body embodies with what you identify you know, somatically. And yeah. from that urgency of feeling oppressed, this is where you go into this trying to, you know, like the desperation to get people to attach to you in that way. Correct. And, and what I want to add to that is then we get into ego dystonic and syntonic thinking. So... The reason I have to bring that up is because when we're in that disembodied state, we, we are basically getting high off those endogenous opioids. We're basically under the influence. Yes. So we actually can't rationalize. We actually, um, we can't even like see what's moral and immoral in that moment. We just go straight into survival. Like, Mm -hmm. We just mm -hmm. go straight into that and we can't really access our higher order of thinking and our mm -hmm. higher order of morality in our prefrontal cortex. Like it's very difficult because we're experiencing that endogenous opioid release mm -hmm. um, through that insecure attachment. So, so another thing I want to point out is when, whenever we're looking at victim and perpetrator, we're looking at a situation of, of oppression we also have to, this is what I do when I work with my clients, we have to really um, tease out what line of thinking is rooted in dissociative logic, which is that ego syntonic thinking, which is um, enmeshed behavior is actually moral. Mm -hmm. And what does yeah. that look like for people listening? Mm -hmm. Like enmeshed behavior is moral. What is that like? Let's use the Instagram example. Just, yes. Just, what does it that would look like? Mean, if you shame someone if you try to shame someone to advocate in such a way, right. But there are others that do not consent to that. Mm -hmm. Right. And let's say you harass them. Cause I want to use like a, a specific example. Like let's say that you put them down via DM, mm -hmm. DM mm -hmm. and you shame them via DM and you take like, you actually personally attack someone through DM um, and like insult them, put them, them down bully them actually cyberbullying that is connected to that so cyberbullying is actually a boundary violation mm -hmm. right and so then we believe that so if i were to believe in in that egocentric state i would say that well for the sake of activism for the sake of mo for moral justice that bullying these people because they've been perpetrators totally justified Mm, mm, mm. that's where that dehumanizing comes in where you can yes. still someone down to you're a perpetrator so now i can justify this i can violation. totally whoop your ass mm, <laughs> yeah yeah it's like i i got every right to do that and 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 that is recurrent that that is something within social justice circles that i have seen yes me too where it's like we have every right to be abusive now because you're the perpetrator and right right we are but, totally cool to do this well and that's so that's where the enabling comes in because you have this person who's dissociated in mm. a fight or flight response they're identifying with the oppressor or the oppressed person i should say mm. and they're feeling you know the anxiety that comes with that detached 
going into this place of saying, okay, because you're doing it this way, I'm morally superior, you're inferior, you're unjust, that gives me permission to bully you. Mm -hmm. And in that bullying, which is, I mean, anyone would call, if it was a partner doing that, you would say they were, it was narcissistic abuse. In mm -hmm. that bullying, the person being bullied might enable them through performative allyship or fawning, right? And this is where this like interesting trauma reenactment onto each other comes in, where they're both enforcing the other one's trauma response. Like my bullying is getting me the attachment I want. And the other person's like, my performance is keeping me good. <laughs> so, you know, they get high off this together, don't they, in, in a way? Indeed. And, and the, what I've seen is that the performance, you know, performative allyship in that sense, right. In a variety of ways, right. That let's see the attachment need that tends to come up the most is actually rejection. It's this, it's this attachment need to be accepted. Mm. accepted. Yep. And so it's this way of basically when I saw it with white people and I, and I, and I'm still seeing this on Instagram, um, in spaces, right. Where, um, where people are not just white people, I'm seeing this overall is normalizing like self-punishment and self-hatred, yep. um, yep. in, and putting oneself down and telling oneself like one is not worthy, um, beating oneself up. And then thinking, if I beat myself up, I'm proving how loyal I am and what yes. a good ally I am. Yes. But that's very performative and, like I said, it's unsustainable. So that I'm just seeing that attachment need of, I I'm, I'm scared I'm going to get rejected, yes. perform well enough, and I want to be a part of community. So so, so you're, you're seeing that actually both on the left and the right. Absolutely. Is really side you know zionist jews all the way to the palestinian side with that cause we're seeing that like everywhere like mm -hmm. we're seeing uh, republicans and democrats we're seeing i mean it's uh, everyone when you say side i hear yeah. everywhere there's a side I, yeah. this dynamic comes in yeah. this is great because it goes back to what you were saying about the secure insecure because yeah. if i have a fear of rejection i really want to belong that's coming from the insecure attachment style because when I'm secure in myself and there's an embodiment in myself and I love myself and there's like a, like you said, a peace inside of me, this is how you open when you were talking about navigating these situations, like instinct based on sensation, like something just doesn't feel right. And following that, if you're disembodied, there, there's nothing to follow. So you look to the other for the belonging, right? Rather than inside, I already belong. And when I feel like good and connected and soft in my body and I have someone yelling at me in a DM, I can consciously assess that I don't want to belong to them. Mm -hmm. And so I don't even perform, you know, mm -hmm. because I'm not looking for the security in them. No, because you're setting boundaries and that and that's that right. self-protection to begin with. And that's a healthy way to um to set boundaries. And that's mm -hmm. very different than also another example i want to say is in that shaming and dming people because they're not choosing a side that they think is like morally mm -hmm. superior those same people think that they're setting boundaries mm -hmm. they think they're setting boundaries yeah but they're not setting boundaries they're actually not taking accountability for their own boundaries it's one thing to communicate how you feel um and that you disagree Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. versus personally right. attacking right. someone and shaming them which is Couldn't agree more and i i like to hold that ambiguity of i understand you and i disagree right when when i can hold those two that's when i go into empathy like you were describing because i can empathize with exactly what would bring you to your belief and your actions and I don't agree with them. Just because I understand them doesn't mean I excuse them or allow them, but I understand them. But that's interesting because I've been I've been watching certain bodies lose their capacity for disagreement. Yeah, they think that if someone disagrees, that there's like a, a harm in disagreement of itself, where where conflict can be like a beautiful intimacy when you can sit with two people in that. And it's 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 resonating because, you know, one reason I connected with you is I was getting so many DMs that mm. were, I mean, so many that were really lovely, by the way, but oh. a handful that were really volatile, volatile. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you say that, 
I saw that I could, I could feel in this body that was yelling at me like, Oh, you're coming from a really disembodied place. You're trying to shame me into accountability, what you call accountability that would feel right to you. Mm -hmm. And that's what took me to what you said about forcing accountability versus the consenting. Mm -hmm. Like I can demand you to be accountable for something, but you're the one that has to consent to even allow accountability to happen. So if I'm just demanding accountability onto you, how abusive do I have to get to make you quote, make you be accountable? And and I want and, and what I want to say to that, so that's a narcissistic defense, right? So that projection is a narcissistic defense, right? And the mindset usually behind that is if you don't do something, you're neglecting me and neglecting the cause. Yes, neglecting, yes. And, and this is where it comes down to childhood neglect. Hmm. This is a big reenactment. You're neglecting me. You're neglecting others. You're neglecting. So then it gets down to roles and duties and responsibilities. Because we're only neglecting when we are neglecting our duty, role, and responsibility. And that's our choice about what we want to be responsible for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not somebody else's choice. It's our choice. Yeah. That, that's, where I, that's where I go into the somatic term of overcoupling. You know, that individual, several of the people that were really attacking me, uh, I could I could see exactly what you just said. They're overcoupling how I'm doing it with neglect. And, and that's interesting you say that because if I think of the insecure attachment and going mm -hmm. back to my first question with you, taking sides to meet attachment needs and then forced withdrawal. So if someone yells at me in a DM, like yeah. you better say these words in your next post, Louise, or you are causing harm. Like as one person wrote. And I was thinking I could feel it's their the detachment, Louise, because then what was that? It, say that again? it's the detachment. So let me, I just want to interrupt. Yeah, because go ahead. I feel like this is a good point then those people, what they're doing is they don't want to set a boundary with you. Louise. That's my assessment. And I don't know them personally, like but that. It, yeah. it's like, they don't, the, you not performing in such a way. This is also a covert contract. This is a covert contract. So their covert contract means that we have an expectation that someone will um, fulfill some type of duty or obligation responsibility, but this has not been consented upon mutually. Mm. So there's no like, mm, it's mm. just pretty much covert. And it's, and it's coming from like one side. And of course you can have two people that are interacting yeah. with covert contracts. Right. But in this example, if you're just hitting that DM and if you're an influencer, like receiving that there is this covert contracts that followers can have. And if you don't perform, based on their like morals and values. And they're going to look at you and think, okay, you know, you have to perform a certain kind of way, but you never consented to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't agree to that. Right. So then in that moment, right. When that person is not getting their covert contract met, yes, they are now going through forced detox because they're not getting their attachment needs met. And they're, they're basically, they are desperate to prevent that detachment, that disconnection. That's right. That's right. So now they're bargaining with you. They're either projecting anger, like they're ang they're in the, the stages of grief because yeah, that, I get that. you're not getting that. You're going to get angry. You're going to go into bargaining. You See, don't this, is, this is where the somatics is so powerful. This is where it, it like plugs right into your theory and your work. Because when you say the first thing I hear covert contract, I hear unconscious, right? It's like we're unconsciously in this contract. No one spoke about it. <laughs> no one consented to it, right? Yeah. So it's an it's unconscious expectation. It comes from these childhood wounds of attachment rupture. Absolutely. And then what, what I love about your language, it always gets me, is when you say detox withdrawal <laughs> that's the somatic to me like it's describing the discomfort when the person you have projected your attachment needs onto doesn't meet that need right the the, the rupture in your own body and again still unconscious to it and probably disembodied to it and then that propels you into greater shaming to, to for the desperation of that attachment need to be met rather than what you said which was brilliant I can shame you because I'm so insecure and I need the attachment or I can create a boundary and walk away from you. They're not yeah. creating a boundary with me. They're actually no, desperately clinging to me right through the mm -hmm. shaming. That's fascinating. 
That's right. And and I've seen that dynamic repetitively with the relationship dynamic as well. Of course, between influencers, the world we're in is influencers. Yeah. Followers. I have seen that that whole dynamic play. Oh out. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, both from and I want to be clear from influencers to followers and from followers to influencers, because I've seen that I've seen call outs, I've seen shaming, I've seen, and, and again, it's one thing to communicate a disagreement and it's quite another when your motivation is, I want to get my hits. I want to get mm. my, apostrophes. I want, mm. so, you know, I watched a, yep. I watched a, 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 um, a post of yours where you discussed how actually some of those people that reject, you said some of those people that reject me, if I get this correct, I actually sense that they kind of want a relationship with me, right? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that was the post on hatred. Yeah. Yes, they yep. want that. They're just not get. They're just not getting it the way they want, and because, mm -hmm. because, and that's when you're in that egocentric thinking. So egocentric is when we think that immoral behavior is morally justified. Say that again. I want to hear that again. Yes, it's when egocentric is when we believe that immoral behavior is morally justified. Love it, love it. Period. And then ego, what we want to do is get to that ego dystonic state, right? Which is where we realize like immoral behavior is not morally justified. It's that's not right. That's right. morally justified, right? And to get to that point, that's where, and we talked a little, we talked definitely about that in previous podcasts, but we've got to hit those rock bottoms. Yes, yeah. We can no yes. longer benefit. And this, Luis, this is where it's very hard for people to stop their narcissism. Because for so long as we benefit, we're gonna keep doing it. That's right. That's 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 how addiction works. For so long as we feel we're benefiting from it, we're gonna keep doing it. But be benefiting through this lens, just to go back to that yeah. word narc, benefiting is not feeling like Right, Correct. those opioids that the body creates, it protects you from that rock bottom sorrow, Correct. unpleasant feeling. Correct. And it just all it does, there's because the truth is, is that there's so much we can learn about ourselves, our personality, who we truly are, by holding emotional space for not getting our attachment needs met. Because yes. we, we didn't get our attachment needs met. And that was painful. And then what happens in social media when these situations go down is that we're reminded of our childhood traumas, which we don't want to feel. We don't want to be, let's say, reminded uh, of neglect we experience yeah. as kids. And that's where unconsciously this gets reenacted. I've seen that. It's like in Absolutely. I, I mean, I love, you know, every time you hear I've seen that, I think of what you said earlier about you can empathize because you can be accountable for your own narcissistic behavior. Every time you say I've seen that, I hear myself saying, and I've done that. Like, I know that feeling of desperation where I don't want to be reminded of the years of bullying, you know, in school. And so I felt when someone DMs me something really, you know, seemingly violating and, and shame, shaming, I feel that part in me that would be the covert that mm -hmm. would say, Ooh, I don't want to feel bullied again. I'll, I'll say whatever you want. So you like me. Yeah. And then I can also feel the part that's overt that wants to like yell at them. Like I feel both those. <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel, but I'm, like, I'm going to shame you better. <laughs> right. Cause right. it feels good. Right. Cause, Cause it we, feels cause, good. It feels good it to feels not good. feel that pain anymore. And that's what I've been really riffing on these last two weeks. I've been really contemplating helplessness. And and I and this is what in the future I want to do some work on you with with you on this. <laughs> Not on you with you. Um, <laughs> around, <laughs> you're already doing your work around helplessness because if we could learn how to embody and relate to helplessness and unfold in that these behaviors wouldn't have to exist. They'd be obsolete because we, we feel, we've not even comfort, but we find a belonging in our own helplessness. Yeah. But I find we, we propel from our helplessness into these shameful or covert uh, fawning tactics. And I, and in that sense, you know, in the work that I do and, and when the work that we do, right. Um, this is again, it helps so much to have someone who can help support your accountability yes. because now why is that because we're not we're not in our right mind when it all goes down mm -hmm. so it helps to have someone go you know what 
because this is all about that addiction recovery. It helps to have a sponsor, so to speak. You know, yep, I don't call absolutely. it sponsorship, I call it mentorship, but that's basically what it, it's like to be of witness to say, I've been there, I've done that. You, I know that you don't feel you're in control and I get that you don't feel you're in control. And let's say when you hold space for that vulnerability, for that helplessness, um, correct. And we, what we're doing, Luis, what you're doing in that regard is that you're, it's, it's a disruption of the normalization of the enmeshed behavior. And that's got to go yeah. down. Yeah. Like that we can enable that numbing. Mm -hmm. So you identified your own narcissism, kind of like, this is where I numb. I can feel myself numb. I could totally go out and do that. That's my, so you're in, so we have something similar. Uh, <laughs> my, my default <laughs> narc behavior <laughs> is to fail, fail to enforce boundaries, right? Yeah, yeah. Just, I just, you know, I want to be accepted. I want to be like, like me. I like me. Like, I don't want to be rejected, you know, and, yeah. and, cause I, and interesting because I was actually bullied as a kid. So that does connect to absolutely. I totally get that. Totally get it. And then um, and that's my dominant enmeshment strategy. Right. Um, and then the and then the opposite, of that, again, that secondary enmeshment, then when you said, oh, and then I just want to like push. Right. That whole combination is disorganized attachment. It's passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. so it's like I what that is is I failed to enforce my own boundaries. Mm. So now I regret it. Ooh, and that's I my jam. Like, that's my oh, biography. That's my autobiography. Oh, I regret <laughs> that. I am disappointed in myself. Yeah. And now I need to make a comeback and totally mm. like um fake set boundaries yeah. and be violent and nasty. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's like yeah. the comeback and 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 that's the whole fight response is i mean it's both are disembodied both are of course both are disembodied that's right none of it is where we're feeling safety from within that's it, exactly right that's i think that's so powerful because when we we can see like this is what every war has, that i've lived through not experience yeah. but witness has ever taught me Right is what you just said. When the safety doesn't come from within, we can do some pretty heinous things to the outside world trying to create quote safety or peace. And that you know, I wanted to add a somatic piece to what you, you were just saying about needing the sponsor or the mentor. Uh accountability takes capacity because accountability is highly sensational. You know, to to feel where you've wronged yourself or wronged somebody else or where you've been out of your integrity is one, one of the most unpleasant physical sensations when you really sit in that. And so I, I've been playing with this in my mind as well. You know, you hear a lot of um, people talk about ableism and such. And it, this might sound like a stretch, but it's this interesting form of ableism to assume that someone has the capacity to be accountable the way I want them to be. And yes. I've been playing with that because it's like it takes someone's body and their generational trauma to come online, so much yeah. depth and pain to be accountable yeah. that you can't force that without them having the capacity and like you said, the support. So yeah. I like this invitation for people listening to consider how can you support someone's accountability when they consent to it compared to forcing accountability through shame or you know desperation. Uh, I think it's an interesting switch. Correct. And to do that, you have to be able to first do it with yourself. In that's order right. Then, because you cannot. And that's the big piece in all of this, right? Is that you actually can't hold people accountable genuinely, because that's the question. Are you really holding people accountable genuinely? Well, not when you're coming from that disembodied state, right? Mm -hmm. Like that. I do believe in holding people accountable but but it needs to be moral. It can't be enmeshed. It can't be narcissistic. It can't be numbing. It can't be. I don't want to feel it. So, this so what does is, it look like for you? Like what your way of doing it or your desired approach? What does it look mm -hmm. like? Well, it's a case by case basis because every body and every person and their history of trauma is different. Like I've seen enmeshment mm -hmm. patterns, but but. Like, in other words, what is the standard, right? Essentially, like what, what does, what does working towards that recovery work? What does that healing begin to look like? Right. Um, again, it's, you stop violating people's boundaries mm -hmm. and you enforce your own boundaries. Mm -hmm. 
That's it. That's it. That's you interesting. Gotta be able to do that. If I'm enforcing my boundary, I'm not waiting for your accountability. It's like I'm I'm resolving the situation myself by saying no, walking away, reporting something if I need to. You know, like having a boundary is very different from enmeshing through shame to try to get something out of somebody, right? It's like I'm violating my boundary when I do that in a way. Correct. And and there also needs to be the consent, right? So we yes. we also those of us that, you know, tend to go in that that issue that we have, you know, of failing to enforce boundaries. We also have to con- consent to ourselves and a relationship with ourselves, guess what? If we want to maintain our integrity, right? If we want to be really honest to ourselves, guess what? We're not going to get, sometimes we're just not going to get our attachment need met. Mm -hmm. And and it's important to tend to that emotional pain. You're just, sometimes you're just not going to get what you want. And I want to kind of tie that also to war. Mm -hmm. Because with war, what I see is when you, when War to me is, I'm not getting my attachment need, so I'm going to like force it out of you. And what I mean by this is the mm. a, a, aggression of it. it Absolutely. It, it's like, I'm going to force it instead of, you know what, <laughs> um, like with colonialization, right? Instead of the British or, you know, Western European countries going, well, you know, we're just not going to get those diamonds in, <laughs> in Africa, yeah. which that would result in violating people's boundaries and hurting <laughs> <laughs> you, know, like, you, know, you know what i'm saying yeah and yeah i do instead of just accepting like i gotta accept i'm not gonna get luxury mm. i'm not gonna get that because that luxury gives me self-soothing it soothes my emotional mm. pain right mm. by by numbing out the pain of stress mm-hmm. right like i'm experiencing stress in my life luxury is going to relax. I mean, luxury is not bad to be clear to everyone. Luxury is not bad, but, but it is a problem when we have luxury. And then of course we end up violating people's boundaries. That's the piece when the luxury means I'm hurting or violating somebody. That's right. It's a mesh. So instead of, so then with war, a lot of the time, it's like the, 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 we're talking about when people go into war, they then go into this egocentric thinking that they're morally justified yep. in taking something from someone that you know that doesn't belong to them. Absolutely, because they're in a lot of emotional pain. And again, I I always tie that to family enmeshment, family dynamics, um, narcissism in the family, mm-hmm. childhood trauma, mm-hmm. reenactment trauma, to where it just becomes macro. So it's yep. like to me, it's like again, I'm gonna I'm gonna intimidate you, force my way to get that attachment because i'm so desperate this is what i see when i see narcissistic behavior like that i'm desperate and i'm an addict and i'm struggling a hundred and ten percent is how i see it and you you're yeah. you're really driving this piece home that i've been uh instinctually sitting with around the helplessness because think imagine you know if i imagine myself in like a british body or whatever body and i want to go to another continent or another land and destroy that land for something i want and yeah. I realized, well, if I do that, I'm going to hurt a bunch of people. It's not very kind. You know, it's immoral. <laughs> right. I have to learn how to sit with helplessness. Like I'm helpless to this thing I want. I can't get that if I, I, if I don't want that. to hurt somebody. I, I think that's a brilliant, this is where it goes to your words, withdrawal and detox. Because mm-hmm. when we're talking about, I can't get that, we're not talking about diamonds. We're talking about the soothing. That's what it really comes down to. That's so, true. and what you said earlier, I thought was really profound how much we learn about ourselves and how deep our self-connection, our medicine can go when we can sit in those moments of attachment rupture, when we don't get attachment needs met. I do believe that it could, you know, the, the primary reason I do the work that I do is because I also accept, and this was hard for me to accept years ago, talk about my own realization of my own helplessness, because Mm -hmm. when I became a social worker and I went to graduate school, my mindset was of that narcissistic say, I'm going to change everyone to change the world. I was the same that, way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to like be so drive. social work and oh, I'm yeah. going to push it grassroots and I'm going to push it. Me too. And it just didn't yield the results. So then I had to accept like, Oh, like actually if we want to end violence in the world, it starts with us and it mm. starts on our own household. You know that saying, man, that's if you right. for your house. That's right. 
if you don't handle it in your house, it's going to end up leaking outside of the house, right? So taking responsibility for violence in the home. And that's, Louise, where as a society, that's very taboo. Talking yes, about the way that our parents have been abusive, parents who have kids that if, like I have lots of clients, like they have verbally, you know, abuse their children, mildly physically abuse them. Um, and they then have to take accountability for that. But again, That's they can, right. and they choose to do it. Um, the thing is, is that Luis, we have a society where, where do, for example, where do perpetrators go if they want to get better? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and not just that, the truth is, is that to me, everybody's a perpetrator and everybody's a victim, but first we're victims. We first start out as victims and then we can become perpetrators. And we are all, I don't, there's not a single person that I've ever met. And I don't think this is like, we all act in one of those two enmeshed yep. ways where we're more. violating somebody else's boundaries or failing to enforce our own boundaries. It's not just one or the other. It's and not. And when, when you said it's taboo, it, it really rang to me. The it that's also taboo is when you grow up in a culture that is all about war and you come from the roots of war and oppression and such, yeah. it, it's taboo to not oppress, which is strange, right? But mm -hmm. if you think about like when, when I say to someone, and I know you get flack for this too, when you mm -hmm. say to someone, the peace starts in you, you get a lot of like hate mail <laughs> because we're so used to this this story that the peace starts over there. So we have to go and force it. And that's the, that's the same thing that's happening in Israel and Palestine right now. That's what happened with America and Iraq. That's what happens in every war is we say, oh, the peace is over there. It's not in our home. We need to go violate their home to enforce peace. <laughs> so it's the micro macro right there is well, like, it's a, like, what's hypocritical, is it not? Because that's like, yes. let's say the peace. Peace is an attachment need. So then what, what are we saying? Mm. That we're going to get the attachment need of peace? Mm -hmm. We are. That's the that's delusion. <laughs> it, it's it, the motion. <laughs> but but it's, it's phenomenal because yeah. I'm seeing this, this, this micro-macro relationship of the people who are DMing really volatile things to me about hashtagging like, you know, and ceasefire. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking how interesting it is that they want this huge state to end a ceasefire and they can't even pause before they DM something hateful to me. It's like, that's that thing we're talking about, the micro and the mm -hmm. macro, how they reflect each other. And, and that um, leads to corruption, Luis, because when we go, because this is what I was thinking when I did my grassroots work years ago, right? Before I became a therapist, I thought to myself, um, and then I realized this later in activist spaces in, in my old anti-racism work, Okay, but how do we prevent corruption then within the social justice space? Yes. Because that's the problem. If, if you consider yourself someone that advocates for social justice, mm -hmm. right? But correct. And then you're harming others. You're a hypocrite. Okay. And that's what tends to be taboo. And that's where I think we get what we get. But it is the truth. But... I also want to say that that kind of resistance is a sign that one does not consent to accountability. What resistance? Um, the the projection of the DMs. Uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, that is also a sign. So when I work with my clients and I get, when I first work with clients, they'll think they know. I mean, every single one of my clients said this, no matter how mm -hmm. much they listen to what, I'm getting, what I say, and what mm -hmm. I teach, they're still hell bent on performance of course like they even think i'm going to teach them performance i don't teach mm. performance. so they then they go through this period and i say all of this because everyone you know it can perhaps learn from this they go through a period of i'm not going to get i'm not going to get my attachment needs with april educating me on how to perform mm. i think this is what's going to get my attachment needs met right mm -hmm. um and when that, and when I, when I experience that resistance from them, here's the thing, I don't take it personally 
because you. I used to take it personally when I did anti-racism work because I had not healed enough myself. So I That's couldn't, right. I, was, I was very disembodied, jumped right into anti-racism and I hadn't done enough racial trauma healing myself. So then therefore that's how I got to justifying, let's say, oh, you know, like white people are this, this, that, you know, and I thought it was cool, you know, to abuse white people to chain them, change, yeah. you know, because they're never going to change anyway. And all these, you know, oh, yeah. you know syntonic, you know, thinking, but so. I love that you came from that and you were able to transform out. It's so beautiful. And it, and it, and as I kind of had stated before, you know, years ago, it was Shavasana and yoga that really corpse pose that, you know, um, that the corpse pose is really what helped awaken and, and help me. Mm-hmm. And, oh, oh my God, those white people don't really know what they're doing. Like it mm-hmm. hit like in Ooh, after, you know, corpse pose is actually what I had a really intense yoga session for myself, really intense, sweating my butt off. And then when I was in, you know, corpse pose, it just hit me like, oh, those white people actually don't. And I didn't even, I wasn't trauma informed enough myself to have the words to understand. Oh, that's dissociation. Like yeah. that's because it's not something we're taught in, in, nope. in graduate school. Like, this is dissociation. This is a, most of us learn that after, but that resistance is, I don't want to be accountable for that. So then, That's then right. I experienced an experience with my clients where they find out real quick, I'm not going to enable your performance. I'm setting boundaries with you. You can either, you know, this is what I can do for you. This is what I can't do for you. These are my boundaries. At that point, they either, you know, they, they continue to work with me or they don't work with me. Right. Yeah. You and break that truth, cycle off between you two, even you interrupt that cycle. <laughs> Yeah. And, and occasionally I, and it hasn't happened in a while, but, but back in the day I had to disconnect with these people myself because they were so wanting to get the attachment need from me. I had to just disconnect. Yeah. Well, because- I'll say, you know, from your work that taught me so much in 2020, when I first found you in your work with the somatic work, these last three years, it's amazing when these dams came in, I did not even feel a bolt of lightning in my body. I was like, just like you you felt in Shavasana, I was witnessing them and I was witnessing pain. I was witnessing fear. I took none of it personally. I'm like, they don't even know me. And my my instinct was like, I wish I could help you feel safer in your body and then we could have a conversation. Whereas in the past, my instinct would have 100% been to fawn. I would yeah. immediately apologize, went into explanations, made endless post apology. It would just been this huge apology frenzy to secure that attachment need. Uh, but luckily, I have a pretty secure attachment with myself, so I didn't feel the need to to dive for that. Um, we have to stop. This is just, I could go, I, I remember, <laughs> I remember now. It's Our first vlog has like three it's hours long. Deep. We just ended up talking because about it's this. So deep. It's That's so the, deep. It is so deep. And it's so refreshing to hear, you know, like, again, your medicine in this world is you're really able to humanize everybody. Mm -hmm. And when you're able, I don't know another space that exists where someone humanizes the narcissist. I don't know another one. I see endless posts dehumanizing the narcissist, but I don't see anyone humanizing them. So I really love, like deeply love your work and respect you because of that. And I would love to anyone listening to know how they can find you, like how they work with you. Can you tell us that before we close? Absolutely. So the best way to contact me is on Instagram, right? So it's at April Dawn Harder, right? And um, what else? And then as far as working with me, I offer, you know, therapy and mentorship, but um, you know, I got to enforce my boundaries too. So I have kind of a relatively small caseload, you know, to allow time for me to rest and recuperate, you know? Ooh, and so because of that, as far as I often get the question, like, well, how often will you take in plans? Right. I never know because I don't, I don't know and can't predict when people are going to get better. That is again, case by case basis. And, or if they, like I said, just don't want to, you know, do the work, that's their Mm -hmm. choice. uh, If they don't want to do that. Um, but basically on average, I usually take people in, uh, in my case on one to two times a year. So it's not that often. Um, but what I will say is that, and I don't know how long this is going to take, but I, I haven't done a course in years. 
And I am working on like creating a course and it will be like group mentorship. Cause I did this nice years ago, I would do group coaching and now it's just meant it's been mentorship, you know, since mm-hmm. 2020. And so I would say just follow me on Instagram, be on the lookout. Um, oh, one more thing. I can't, I will say this. I do have a podcast. I've rebranded it. I've redone it. It's called liberating from enmeshment. Mm, And my focus is really to help people to liberate themselves from enmeshment. When you begin to realize that, um, Hey, my enmeshment, the way that I violate other people's boundaries or the way that I fail to enforce my own boundaries, um, it feels like personal slavery. Like I am, you know, I can't stop myself. Mm -hmm. This is not what I want to do. When you really are at that point where you're like, I need to liberate myself from this, um, instead of succumb to it. Once you realize like, this is not good for me, it works towards personal liberation, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, which is that personality development, which is, acting in your own integrity, acting in accordance with your authentic self, as opposed to the performance, which is inauthentic. So when you're ready to do that, um, that's going to be a great thing. And, um, but yeah, the podcast is very educational. So for those of you who want to learn and and explore that, I I highly recommend going to my Instagram, going to the link in the bio and um, subscribing to the podcast. Thank you for your work. And thank you for this time. I've learned so much as usual. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes. Take a breath. And let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com.